Audible Inc. presents Training Days, a Chris Longknife novella, written by Mike Shepard, narrated by Dina Perlman. Lieutenant Chris Longknife had almost finished her long to-do list. She had attended the funerals of every man, woman, and saddest of all, child, who died following her into the battle to save their planet. The media and everyone else was calling it the Battle of Wardhaven. She'd also visited the wounded in the hospital, a few more than once. Now there was only one item left on her to-do list. She needed to apologize to Commander Mandanti for what she'd done, stealing his squadron and his honor. Nellie had arranged for them to meet at the O Club on High Wardhaven, a much less formal affair than the one dirt side. Chris arrived ten minutes early to keep Jack Montoya, her Secret Service agent, happy. He arranged for her to have a quiet table in the corner, then settled against the wall between her and the door. How's the commander going to find me with you hulking around between me and the entrance? Chris grumbled. Don't worry, he'll spot you. I'm more worried about someone else spotting you. Whoever sent those battleships our way can't be happy about losing them. I figure you're near the top of their don't like list. Jack, this is Wardhaven. Nobody's going to try to assassinate me here, Chris said, letting exasperation flood her voice. And exactly where was your little brother kidnapped? Jack asked. Chris was saved from having to answer that question when Commander Mandanti entered and headed directly for Chris's table. You called him, Chris whispered. You don't have to have a computer as smart as Nellie to tell somebody what table you've grabbed at the club. The commander's arrival put an end to that debate as Chris stood to meet him. Chris hadn't seen the old commander since the battle. His gray hair seemed totally white. He'd been recalled from retirement to ride herd on the Mosquito Boat Squadron and its hooligan junior officers. As she took her seat, she asked him how his battle had gone. We damn near had to push the old Cushing away from the pier. Her engines picked that moment to remind us that she was a wreck and should have been sent to the breakers 15 years ago with the rest of her class. Anyway, we managed to trail Santiago in the Halsey through most of the fight, but when she made her last charge, we kind of fell by the wayside. We did our bit, but it was hardly a glorious ending for the old boat. She'll finally make her trip to the wreckers tomorrow, and not a moment too soon. Chris listened intently both for the story and any underlying feelings. He seemed content to have fought the first battle of his 40-year career and to have survived it. Chris took a deep breath and began her apology. I'm sorry I took over the squadron from you, sir. Is that why we're meeting? You think I'm mad at you for taking the fast attack boats out? I did kind of take command of the squadron away from you, sir, Chris said. What she'd done was not being examined in the media, not formally discussed by the Navy. What was being whispered about at O clubs and cocktail parties was not something Chris was included in. No doubt, a lot of senior officers had their noses out of joint. Commander Mandanti laughed. Still chuckling, he said. Do you honestly think I planned on packing these old bones into one of those fast attack boats and leading the charge, young lady? <laughs> no way. That was why I'd been rotating the command of each division among you young bucks. I wanted that bunch of prima donnas to get a good sniff at how each of you did as a leader. I figured when the fecal matter hit the fan, one of you would be accepted as the clear leader. He leaned forward resting both elbows on the table, and grinned. It worked, didn't it? I wasn't sure it would for a minute there, Chris said. Having announced to one and all that she intended to take command of the squadron, there had been a rough couple of seconds when she thought two or three of the other skippers might object. Certainly Tausig, regular Navy back six generations, had not looked persuaded. Yes, but then Captain Santiago sauntered in, and that was the end of doubt, the commander said. I guess it's true what they say. Every long knife needs a Santiago. Chris had finally found out the truth behind that story. 
Now that she'd seen it in action, she couldn't agree more. Besides, the commander went on, I'd never have thought up your idea of using the tugs to reload and recock the fast attack boats. We never would have gotten those battle wagons without that second attack. Brilliant. Somebody else put the tugs out there, sir. I just figured out an additional use for them. The tugs had to be out there. You have no idea how cranky civilians can get when hunks of wreckage crash down in their living rooms. It's standard to have tugs out to pick up the larger pieces, but to use them to recharge your lasers and refuel your antimatter engines. <laughs> that one wasn't in the book. Trust me, Lieutenant, it will be in the next edition. You bet it will. I'm glad to know that there are no hard feelings, sir. Still, if there's anything I can do for you, all you have to do is ask. Uh, there is one thing, the commander said in a conspiratorial whisper as he leaned across the table. If that princess gig of yours ever takes you to a party where adorable Dora is reporting, could you smack her in the mouth for me, preferably on camera? Tell her it's from the Navy. Chris laughed. The commander was not the only one whose nasty list was headed by Dora Evermorn of Galactic News and Entertainment. <laughs> I wanted to shoot her, Chris said. Better idea, the commander agreed. <laughs> but Jack, my Secret Service agent, takes a dim view of his primary carrying. It's kind of hard to shoot anyone when you've been disarmed. At the taking of his name in vain, Jack interrupted his vigil, checking diners' doors and more for a second, and flashed the two a smile. One fast smile, then he was back on guard. Good man, the commander said. Oh, most of the time, Chris admitted with a sigh. She liked having Jack around. Now if she could just get him to do what she wanted. But Mandante was back on Dora. I can hardly argue that it was bad, us losing so many in the fight. But to say, on the air, that the career and reserves who died didn't matter? We were just doing our job. Mandante let out an exasperated breath. None of us signed up for anything like the one-sided battle that was. Yes, we needed all hands on deck and more hands than they left in port. Yes, it's a shame that so many of the civilians died. And yes, we couldn't have pulled it off without the rag, tag, and bobtail collection that you put together, Your Highness. But I should never have brought in the system runabouts. The Coast Guard Auxiliary were massacred, Chris said, shaking her head. And a couple of those runabouts. They had mom and dad's sister and brother on board. I know. I attended the funerals. The commander leaned across the table and rested his hands on Chris's. Is that what's eating at you? Doesn't it bother you, sir? You haven't seen the tapes, have you? Tapes? What tapes? Van Horn taped his battle board. So did several other ships. A couple survived. I've watched them. I don't care what the media say. The Navy's going to get its history books right this time but it's the massacre of the runabouts that you need to see. I don't think I could stand it, sir. Chris, they knew what they were doing. We all knew that the only ships out there that could do a damn thing against those battleships were the fast attack boats. I knew it, and so did the Coasties on the runabouts. The tape shows when the first one got blown out of space, and the next, and the next. But it doesn't show as anyone flinching. Not one of them tried to break away. They saw their power squadron mates being swatted like flies, and they kept right on charging in. Chris had no words for that kind of courage. And then you recovered with the tugs. They knew no runabouts had made it through the first attack. Half their crews were made up from volunteers who liked hiking around the moon in spacesuits. Knowing what they knew then, they still volunteered. Man, woman, teenager. They were for joining you in your final charge. Commander Mandanti paused to take a deep breath. I've come to believe in the fast attack boats, but I tell you true. Your boat would not have made it in for the final shoot without the tugs and yachts complicating the firing solutions for those bastards. 
Forty years I served this man's navy. Not a shot fired through it all. He paused to finger the Wardhaven defense ribbon, now taking pride of place among his decorations. That day, we few, we band of brothers, lifers or reservists who just kept the coat in the back of the closet, or civilian volunteers who got the word and came, we all sacrificed more than the rest of them that stayed home can ever know or repay. Some sacrificed everything. Those of us who got off with only losing a chunk of our soul owe it to the others to never let them be forgotten. A tardy waiter finally arrived. They ordered. The meal was half eaten before the words began to flow again. When they did, it was the funny things they remembered. Man Dante told about getting the call from fleet headquarters that Chris and her helmswoman had planted a skiff race around the golf course. Did you know you missed four admirals? <laughs> Damn near more stars in that foursome than in the sky. No, sir, Chris said through a bite of club sandwich. If I'd known those four old duffers were admirals, I'd have taken the stick and landed closer. Would have served them right. Chris was in a much better mood when she shook the commander's hand goodbye. Glad that's over, Jack asked her as they headed down the space elevator. Gladder that I did it, Chris said. Chris caught a quick bite on the fly that night as Abby got her gussied up for a ball. The benefit for the arts had been scheduled six months ago, but it would be the first time the beautiful people met after nearly getting their hides nailed to the wall. Chris chose to wear her dress uniform. For once, Abby didn't argue. The uniform seemed to put Chris in a bubble. She moved among the chattering class, catching snippets of conversation, finding nothing she wanted to stop and join, and none of them seemed interested in her. Unusual for a long knife. There was an exception. A man, in full evening tucker and drunk as a deacon, though it was barely nine in the evening, made a beeline for Chris. His fist was balled up and his intent was clear. Without so much as a blink, Jack stepped forward and cold-cocked the guy, grabbing his elbow to keep him from dropping to the floor. Jack glanced around and spotted two waiters already headed his way to take the problem off his hands. That was when Chris realized the drunk was only the distraction. Unnoticed behind him, a slip of a woman stepped around him and Jack, a glass jar in hand, full, and sloshing with something white and stinking. She moved to splatter its contents on Chris. Chris barely had time to recognize the threat, much less turn to run. But Jack was sidestepping into the woman's path. One arm still on the drunk's elbow, he reached out to grab her hand, jar and all. And the contents of the jar ended up in Jack's face. Yuck! Jack exclaimed. You should have let me douse her good, the woman shouted. Tell your dad his farm policy stinks. And now I do, Jack muttered to himself, trying to shake the spoiled milk from his tucks while keeping a solid hold on both troublemakers. Reinforcements arrived. First, two strapping waiters took over the problem children. One offered Jack a towel while making a face at the stink. Then two plainclothes cops showed up, one of each gender, to officially take charge of the disturbers of the peaceful ball. In hardly a minute, the show was over, leaving Jack still toweling himself and muttering something about the princess's detail needing more backup, so he could absent himself at times like this to clean up in the nearest bathroom or go home. The show was just winding down when, much to Chris's relief, she spotted Grandpa Trouble, resplendent in his dress red and blues, coming her way. That was well done, he said to Jack. Quickly, the bubble of silence engulfed the two. The retired general didn't seem to mind, so it was left to Chris to find something to talk about. How come you guys get to look so good in your dress uniforms and we gals just look frumpy? We could hardly let you look sexy like the rest of these half-dressed mannequins. Yes, Chris agreed, as all good junior officers should when addressing a five-star. But there has to be something between this and that, she said, letting her right hand sweep from her dinner dress uniform 
to a woman whose dress left nothing to the imagination. Earn a couple of stars, young woman, then you can try your own hand at uniform design. You'll likely have to. Every ten years, need it or not, somebody always comes down with the uncontrollable urge to change the uniforms. Again, conversation between them came to a halt. They stood, waiting to see if anyone would feel compelled to talk to either of them. No one did. It's hard to believe that a fight for all these people's lives took place not two weeks ago, just 50,000 clicks above their heads. I doubt if most of them even know there was a war, Grandpa Trouble said with a grim smile. Kind of makes you wonder why we did it. Chandra Singh knew what she was fighting for, her husband and her kids. There's a story in the Bible, Chris. You really should read it sometime. It seems God was browned off with some particular chunk of real estate and decided to nuke the place. This guy, I don't remember if he was from the place or not, but he tried to talk God out of it. If there's just a hundred good people here, would you wipe them out with the bad? So God agreed to spare them all if just a hundred good people could be counted. The guy negotiated God down to five or ten, as I recall. Problem was, there weren't even that many decent people in the place. Grandpa Trouble paused to take a sip of his drink. Different people take a lot of different things away from that story. Me? I keep hoping that we can find enough good people to keep the rest of us from going up in flames. He handed his drink, less than half gone, off to a waiter. We found enough this time. Thank whatever God was keeping count. Now, it seems to me that we've spent enough time playing duck in this shooting gallery. What do you say that we blow this place? I didn't get a chance to eat, and I know this great burger place that won't hold it against us that we're overdressed and in uniform. Or smell a little funny. He finished with a grin in Jack's direction. Jack didn't need a second suggestion. Almost as if he had been waiting for it, he led the way out. A secure ride stood at the curb in front of the nearest exit, its motor already running. Eating at Grandpa Trouble's burger place turned out to be a unique experience. Clearly, it hadn't been designed to any standards, but had grown as the owner grew his clientele. It was decorated with pictures of circus acts, animals, and clowns. Lots of clowns. The hamburgers or hot dogs were broiled over an open fire. The aroma roamed freely and was clearly discernible several blocks from the place. Though Chris had eaten earlier, her mouth was watering as she joined the line to order. The folks there were young couples, older couples, and families with kids. Lots of kids. They took Chris and Trouble in, a few nodded, but most just smiled and went about their business. All but one tyke, who seemed particularly intrigued by the two of them. She finally broke away from her handler and toddled up to Chris. Are you a Circus? she asked. Her mother recaptured the escapee and hauled the little one up into a hug. No, they are not from the circus, darling. But before she turned back to her husband and other kids, the mother blushed and said, Thank you for what you did. You're welcome, General Trouble said. When she was gone, he turned to Chris. See what I mean? There are still that few worth fighting for. I see what you mean. When I begin to doubt myself... I come to places like this and remember what I'm fighting for. You need to make up a list of places like this. I think I've got the first place for my list, Chris said. They ordered cheeseburgers and moved along in line while they were cooked. Both Chris and Grandpa Trouble skipped the offered fries, though Jack did partake of the crisscrossed potatoes. Presented with their meal, they stopped at a table at the end of the line and added all kinds of garnishes to the main course before finding a corner to settle in. Jack took up his station some distance out, where he could keep an eye on them, all the exits and most of the customers. The toddler kept eyeing Chris and Grandpa Trouble. Chris hoped Jack would not shoot her if she made another break for the Sursus. They were halfway through the meal, talking about nothing in particular, before Grandpa asked, How's the preparation going at putting your training squadron together? I've hardly started. 
I've been busy attending funerals and visiting hospital wards. Most of the folks I want to include are still mending. You're still mending, he pointed out. My healing needs something to put my back into, more than I need a bed to lie around in. Good attitude, he said, then leaned forward and whispered. Now, let me ask you something. How many times has someone tried to kill you lately? Gee, I've lost count, Grandpa. Should I include those battleships? Nope. They weren't after you in particular, just all of us in general. What I mean is, how many of them are off-planet? And how many are here on Wardhaven? I think all of them were off-planet, Chris said. So having a Secret Service agent here won't do you much good if you're sent to Boynton to train their fast attack boats, now will it? Nope, Chris admitted. So you need a security chief on your staff. You have a Marine you want to suggest to me? No, but maybe you could make yourself a Marine security chief. Chris had no idea where Grandpa Trouble was going, so she filled her mouth full of delicious cheeseburger and let him go on. Some people may not be aware there is a war on, but other folks have noticed it. Ward Haven's parliament has passed a military manpower law. Not only are they giving bonuses to just about anyone willing to sign up, but there's a tiny little section in the back that says people can be drafted for their special skills, Grandpa Trouble said, glancing at Jack. The agent had his eye on the toddler, who looked ready to make a run for it, maybe at him, maybe at Chris. Special skills, Chris echoed. Special skills, like keeping you alive. Interesting. Chris said. What rank would I have to draft him at? I should think first lieutenant would match his present salary. First lieutenant, Chris thought. One very important rank below me. Jack would be in my chain of command and in a solidly subordinate position. And in the Navy, that means I'll be giving the orders and he'll have to follow them. She could have her cake around and enjoy it too. I'll think about that, Chris said. Nellie, find me that law and whatever paperwork I'd need to draft Jack. I have found it, Chris. The paperwork is lengthy. You have to prove a case that this individual you want to draft is uniquely qualified for the job you have. So, Nellie, write up a job description for my security chief, then make sure it matches Jack's unique skills and abilities. It should be a piece of cake for you. Yes, Chris. Do you think this will work as you want it to? This is Grandpa Trouble, with the capital T you are talking to. He's my grandpa, Nelly. He's just looking out for me. Special Agent Juan Montoya, Jack to most everyone, of the Ward Haven Secret Service, was almost feeling relaxed that night. It hadn't started that way. Balls were supposed to be fun. He hadn't met one yet that was. The service had no control over the guest list, which hardly mattered, since just about anyone in a fancy enough set of duds could get in. The night's problem had been one drunk and an agrarian policy protester armed with a jar of month-old milk. His tuck stank and would need a good dry cleaning. But there had been no gun. No gun was a good day. So far, so good. When Chris decided to ditch the scene and head out with her great-grandfather, Jack had contacted the service to coordinate his actions with the general's detail. Surprise, the general wasn't under the service's protection. He'd refused it years ago. Jack found himself wondering what was up. The carnival looked like a cheap eats place that had just kind of grown. Section after section had been added on with no special care for even floors or ease of access. Worse, it had never been surveyed by the service. Hard as it was to believe, no one under their protection had ever visited the place. Jack would have to wing it. He had his computer record all the license plates in the parking lot and run their owners through the critical databases. No person of special interest showed up in the check. In fact, no one with a police record or even so much as an outstanding traffic warrant popped out. Talk about your quiet, picket-fence family types. He called up aerial photos of the place. 
The back had an open eating area that was empty now that it was raining. A small pond was at the foot of a steep rock face 200 feet up. Apparently, the place had begun life as a rock quarry. Someone had done a good job on reclamation. The houses above the cliff were all high-priced for the view. All had working alarm systems. No intruder could get to the cliff edge without half a dozen alarms going off. Jack examined the approaches and found he could cover them. Then he encountered his primary threat for the evening. She was two or three years old and considered Chris and the general the most interesting things, or maybe just the most colorful, that she had ever seen in her short life. The tyke made her first break for Chris while they were in line. Given a choice between spending less time looking for a more serious threat or protecting his primary from being slobbered on, he kept his eyes out and let the kid make a run for Chris. She halted herself a good three feet out and popped the question to Chris. Are you, Circus? Jack suppressed a comment. His primary might not be in a Circus, but there was usually one around her. Then the mother recaptured the escapee and said something to Chris that Jack didn't quite catch. But the look on Chris's face told him she'd just received the balm her blistered soul needed. Jack paid for his own burger. Chris's money had been refused, and the general only managed to pay for his own meal by insisting he'd spent the whole of the recent unpleasantness chained to a desk. Jack guided his primary to a table that looked the safest in the house. There were windows all around, but the closest windows opened on the cliff with no view from the top, and the other windows showed the parking lot, a small road, an open field, and more cliffs. No long rifle could draw a bead on his primary, and anyone who had a field of fire had to come into his sight first. He took a bite out of his burger. It was good. Juicy enough to explain the wad of napkins on his tray, and just plain what a burger should be. Jack enjoyed chewing as he did his checks. The tyke and her parents and big brother and sister had been joined by another couple with a baby, also in a high chair. The eight of them had taken a table in the opposite corner, giving Chris and her great-grandfather as much distance as they could while still getting a pleasant view of the pond and cliff. That managed to hold the toddler's interest as she crammed her mouth with french fries and a few tidbits of meat. Jack finished his meal about the same time the kid did. She demanded to be let down, at first as a pleasant request, then quickly in a louder and more demanding voice. Her dad got her out of her high chair, and she quickly toddled off to examine the pictures of circus wagons full of animals with clowns around them. The examination of art done, her interest turned back to Chris and the general. Jack made his usual checks of the situation and timed the kid to a T. She made a break for them, just as Jack figured he had a good ten seconds free. As she bounced by him, each step a clear defiance of the law of gravity, Jack snaked an arm out to catch her and lift her up in the air above him. She greeted her capture with a happy giggle and a proud declaration. You stink! Like baby! What a night! Even a two-year-old didn't much care for Jack's bouquet. The mother was at a full gallop, intent on reacquiring her wandering offspring, an apology already on her lips, when the general gave out a belly laugh. Hey, let the kid through. I could use some grandpa time with something a darn sight more manageable than most of my brood. Jack handed the kid off to her mother, who looked ready to haul her spawn off to permanent detention. But the general applied more urging, laid on with a shovel, and the mother relented and risked the permanent warping of her child by turning her over to general trouble. With no regard for his dress uniform, he took the kid, greasy hands and all, and bounced her on his knee. She rewarded his effort with more happy giggles. A poor old man has to take baby time where he can get it seeing how some of his descendants are taking their time producing little people for an old man to spoil. Remember, Grandpa, a gal's supposed to find a husband before she finds kids. <laughs> it's not like I can draft one. This left Jack doing another situation check, which took only half of his attention. The other half was mulling over that strange word, draft. 
Wardhaven hadn't had a draft since the Aitichi War 80 years ago. What had brought that word to Chris's mind? He found out the next day. The day started early and went long. He'd finally gotten Chris settled down in Newhouse a bit after 6 p.m. He was headed home when his personal computer beeped and informed him he was wanted at headquarters. He tried calling his boss but ended up talking to his computer. It announced that he was gone for the day and, absent a matter of life or death, I'm going to see my son's ball game and I'm going to watch it undisturbed. Jack drove downtown, puzzling over who might want him and why. Only when he got there did his computer update that he was to report to personnel. Jack headed for the public front of the building, wondering why someone in personnel would need him. For the last six years, his only contact with them had been easily handled by swapping files and updates. The receptionist seemed to be expecting him. She took him back to a small, windowless office among the cubicles and carefully closed the door behind him. Hello, Special Agent Montoya, a seated man said from behind a cluttered desk. He wore a white shirt and narrow red tie. A plaid sports coat that might have been in fashion five years ago was on a coat rack. How do you want to handle this military activation? Would you like us to suspend your career appointment pending your return, or would you prefer to resign your appointment? You have career status, so you could apply for reinstatement at any time. What? Jack got out. At the sight of a gun, he was prepared to react in a split second. This stream of words that he only half understood left him confused as to which end was up. <laughs> it's possible I've gotten ahead of myself, the young man said. Here is your copy of your draft notice, he said, handing a yellow sheet of paper across the desk to Jack. Draft notice? Jack stammered. <laughs> yes. Aren't you aware that you are being drafted into the Marine Corps? Jack eyed the paper. It did have his name on it. No, I didn't even know we had a draft, he said, trying to remember where he'd heard that word more recently. We didn't until last week. Buried in the new military appropriations bill was a small section, only a couple of words, but it did allow for certain people with unique skills to be drafted for the duration of the state of planetary emergency or the time their special needs are required, whichever is shorter. Jack eyed the paper and forced himself to read it slowly. And I'm being drafted into the Marines as a first lieutenant for the job of security chief to a serving member of the blood. Yes. No, it's not so bad. They can save your pay. Unfortunately, not your overtime, but this paper I have here from the Marines says you're being appointed to the rank of O2 with 10 years service credit so you'll be getting $52 a month more. Jack made a face. His overtime pay often accounted for over a third of his monthly paycheck. The Marines were not saving his pay. So, to answer my first question, are you prepared to resign your appointment with the Secret Service, or do you want to be put on leave without pay pending your return to service? Make it leave without pay, Jack growled. With any luck, I'll be back in pay status this time tomorrow, if not sooner. His mother hadn't raised any dumb kids, although the jury was still out on his youngest brother. Jack knew exactly where this draft notice had come from and exactly who was going to regret it. Regret it real fast. Just as he was leaving headquarters for Newhouse with a full head of steam up, his computer beeped. A call for you from General Torden. Tell him I'm busy. He says you really want to talk to him. Now what could General Torden mean by that? Then Jack remembered his nickname, Trouble. I'll take it. Jack snapped. Hey, Jack. We hardly got to know each other, what with Chris around and you busy keeping her from being perforated. Any chance we could share a beer, have a bite to eat? Jack recalled what he knew about General Trouble. Trouble to his enemies, trouble to his friends double trouble to his superiors, of whom there were now few, but apparently triple trouble to anyone who got too close to his great-granddaughter. Jack put two and two together and didn't like the answer. 
He managed to bite back something really nasty and settled for, I, yeah, I guess I'm not doing anything for dinner tonight. There was no use bearding the cub in her cage when this mess had more than likely originated with the old bear himself. The general named a dive Jack had taken Chris to a few weeks ago and a time not 30 minutes from then. Jack made it there 10 minutes early. The general was already in a booth with two beers on the table. This left Jack wondering if he was getting predictable or just being played by someone way above his league. No matter. It was Jack's life and he would play it his own way. He was also the guy with a gun. He slipped into Grandpa Trouble's booth and took a long pull on the beer. It was a good one. So, what's it like keeping my great-granddaughter from getting herself suddenly dead? The old general asked, then took a pull from his beer. Jack noticed how that let him hide his face behind the mug. Was he smiling? Some days harder than others. I think that little kid had the right question. What circus did she escape from? Not a circus, a zoo, said a man who had caused many a zoo a lot of trouble. Jack's temper was at its limit. So whose idea was it anyhow, drafting me? Chris's, I imagine, the general said, and hid again behind a long, slow pull on his beer. Yes, Chris's, I suspect, the old man went on. Seems to me that she's been taking more pot shots when she's off planet on Navy business than when she's just gallivanting around Wardhaven, don't you think? Yes, but you have to admit it's a whole lot easier to keep her from bleeding out when I've got the whole service to call on. That Tarantic trip was one surprise after another. All we could do was be the fastest moving target the law allowed. Jack put the beer down and eyed the old general. Yes, Ray and I read that report, the one she didn't edit. It reminded us too much of old times. Now it was Jack's turn to lean back and study trouble. Had he just told Jack that the king himself was following Chris's antics? The old man put down his beer and sighed. Ray and I did a lot of damn fool stunts when we were younger and didn't know any better. How we survive to be the old cusses we are today shows there is a god somewhere in heaven looking after fools, drunks, and really foolish drunks. The old guy smiled at his own joke. Jack had a strong feeling where this was going. Sir, I have to tell you, I've sworn to take a bullet for that young woman. But damn it, does she have to enjoy running back and forth in the shooting gallery? I don't want to be the one holding her after I tell her to zig and she insists on zagging and I can't get in front of her fast enough. It's one thing to say you'll take that shot, another thing entirely to have to chase after her to get it. There, the card was face up on the table. Let's see how the old fellow reacts to that. Said old fellow put his head back and laughed. Then, a long moment later, he picked up his glass and took a long pull. I have no idea how many gray hairs I caused my old man, my grandpa. I wasn't around home all that much after I joined the Marines. Maybe it was just as well for all of us that they didn't know what I was up to. Maybe I shouldn't be reading the deep background reports Ray and I are paying a pretty penny for. But I don't see us swearing off them. Ignorance is not bliss. Only a way to get you and a whole lot of good troops butchered. So what can we do? Drafting me into the Marines is not going to do any good. I can't help but notice Chris is a Navy lieutenant, and I'm to be a Marine first lieutenant. As I understand ranks, that puts me a very significant one below her. It looks to me like I'll still be stuck running around after her, trying to knock her legs out from under her a second or two before the shot cuts the air where her lack of brains was. I see your problem, the old general agreed. However, it may not be as bad as you think. Jack raised a questioning eyebrow at that. The same military appropriations bill that my lovely great-granddaughter used to draft you has other surprises in it. Call up the revised Title 10 356.911. Pay particular attention to subparagraphs Paren D and F. Jack had his computer do that and watched 
as it projected paragraph after paragraph of legal mumbo-jumbo, covering the table with whereases and therefores, and worse. Sir, <laughs> I'm good at keeping someone in one piece. I'm not a lawyer, or worse, a lawmaker. The takeaway from all that is right about there, the general said, making a stab at the mass of gobbledygook, upside down from where he sat, and put his finger right on, a security chief of a serving member of the blood shall take all necessary precautions to preserve that individual from harm. Why did Jack strongly suspect that individual had been hastily added after her had been scratched out? What's that mean? Jack asked. Well, General Trouble said, leaning back in the booth, I understand that when two different groups have two different interpretations of what a new law means, they usually go to court. Now, it seems to me that you and Chris can either spend all your time cooling your heels in court, or you can figure that out yourselves. <laughs> yeah, right, Jack said. Jack's computer woke him early and informed him that he had an 0730 appointment with Gunnery Sergeant Brown at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot just outside of Wardhaven on Harbor Drive Road. He was halted at the gate of MCRD by a corporal of the guard, who studied his Secret Service credentials and his Marine orders while a team did a thorough search of his car. The corporal made a call, then waved him through, after giving him directions to Officer Intake. Officer Intake was a wooden temporary left over from the Aitichi War, which told Jack what the Corps must think of its incoming officers. A busy lance corporal didn't run Jack down when he got in his way, but did allow a second to direct the interloping civilian to Gunny Brown, with a smile on his face that gave Jack all the warning he would get. Gunny Brown was a bear of a man, and as black as his spit shine shoes. When he unwound himself from his desk, Jack found himself looking up. You're five minutes late, Lieutenant Montoya. We're behind schedule. Please come with me. Jack followed where he was led. In ten minutes, he was fingerprinted, signed away his life, and was sworn in. Hold off taking his picture until he's in uniform, the gunny ordered the personnel type and led Jack next door. There, a stack of uniforms awaited him, ranging from formal dinnerware to battle dress and several different colors in between. The uniform of the day today is green, sir, Gunny said, pulling a pair of green pants, a green coat, and tan shirt and tie from the collection. Please get into uniform. Jack changed in a curtained-off area, switching his service automatic and its underarm holster to his tan shirt before putting on the green coat. Gunny surveyed him and did not look happy at what he saw. The pocket flaps on your blouse, sir, are always worn on the outside of the pocket. We try to keep the pockets empty. Your field scarf is improperly tied, Gunny said, and proceeded to retie it. Jack tried to memorize the new vocabulary. Not coat, blouse, not tie, field scarf. This can't be too hard, can it? Done with the tie, Gunny adjusted the fall of Jack's blouse. I see you're carrying a sidearm, sir. Yes, Jack said, wondering if he'd have to defend his weapon. I was advised you would be. We tailored your uniforms to Embassy Marine Officer standards to allow for that. Apparently satisfied with Jack's appearance, Gunny stood to attention and saluted. After a moment, he said, An officer always returns a salute, sir. Jack did his best to return the honor. Gunny frowned. You need to get the elbow a bit lower, sir. You aren't trying to fly like some squid type, and the hand needs to turn in a bit more, sir. Those blokes on Lorna do salute with their palm out, we do it palm in. Squids can't seem to make up their mind and go kind of limp-wristed. Jack made a note to keep Gunny's opinion to himself around Chris and other squids. Oh, sir, you owe me a dollar. Dollar, Gunny? New officers always reward the first enlisted swine to salute them with a dollar. Jack suspected his credit chit would not do, but he kept coins in his pocket in case his primary wandered off the grid so far that vending machines didn't take credit. He produced four quarters. Thank you, sir. 
Now, I have a book for you. The Marine Officer's Guide. Yes, it's an old-fashioned book. You can buy yourself an e-copy, but most Marine officers keep this hard copy in their footlocker until they've memorized it. You'll also find a reading list. I suggest you read it, sir. Will you sign the bill, sir? And Jack was presented with a surprisingly large bill for his uniforms. I thought uniforms were provided. For us folks that work for a living, sir. But you officers have to pay for your own. Jack decided that discretion was the better part of valor and chose not to notice the work-for-a-living remark. He signed the bill. We'll fold these into a footlocker, sir, and ship them to your first duty station. And where is my duty station? Jack asked. Gunny looked at his paperwork. Says here, new house, sir. Why am I not surprised? Jack turned to leave. Sir, you forgot your cover, Gunny said, handing Jack a hat. I don't wear hats, Jack said. Sir, no Marine ever goes outside without being under cover. Cover, not hat. Blouse, not coat. Field scarf, not tie. The list is growing. Now, sir, if you'll just come with me to have a picture taken, your retina scanned, and a drop of your blood processed, we can get you a proper marine ident. Jack didn't get away until almost 8.30. Or was it oh, 0.830 now? Right. He arrived at Newhouse to find the familiar marine guards grinning as they saluted him, and waited expectantly as he returned the salute. Are we your first, sir? No, Jack growled, dropping his salute. Where is she? Waiting for you in the library. She's pissed, sir. We had orders not to let her out of the house until you got here, and she says you're late. I'm a lot of things, but late isn't one of them. Jack did his untrained best to march in the door, across the foyer, and into the library. Chris looked up and smiled. Chris had spent an hour going through mail that Nellie could have handled herself. Where was Jack? Why wouldn't the Marines let her leave on her own? Chris did not enjoy cooling her heels. Then Jack marched in, resplendent in undress greens. Greens with one single silver bar on his epaulets. Chris had two silver bars on the color of her undress whites. Railroad bars, someone had called them. Nellie had had to look up the term. Obsolete or not, Chris was an O3 and Jack was an O2. That should settle a whole lot of things. Chris knew she was failing to suppress a smile as she stood. Good, you're here. Let's go. You're late. Where are we going? Jack said. I want to talk to several of the people I intend to have on my training command team. Penny is still in the hospital, though she's coming home today. Chief Benny would be good. We can chase him down at the barracks that the survivors of the Halsey are sharing. Or not, Jack said, stepping in front of her to block her way. Chris sidestepped him. He sidestepped to stay in front of her. What are you doing, she demanded. It would be safer for you to stay in Newhouse, where we control admission, and have Penny and Chief Benny come to you. I expect they could be here for lunch. Your cook would make it worth their while. That was a good suggestion, but Chris did not like the sound of it coming from Jack. I'd rather go see them. Step aside, Lieutenant. We have places to be. No, Lieutenant, you are not going out. They will come in. Marine, you need to study your ranks. You are a Marine First Lieutenant. I am a Navy Lieutenant. I outrank you. I say jump, you say how high on the way up. Jack stood to attention. Yes, ma'am. I understand this whole rank situation you've drafted me into. In most events, you say jump, and I will say how high on the way up. Although, if I may point out, once I'm off the ground, I've lost my leverage to determine the altitude I will achieve. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, you are showing an attitude, Chris growled. However, as the security chief of a serving member of the blood, I am required to take all necessary precautions to preserve you from harm. Preserving you from harm means keeping you out of the shooting gallery as often as possible. Ergo, your future team comes to you, not you to them.
I can have my computer contact those two if you don't want to have your Nellie do the job. I can do it, Nellie piped in. Not now, Nellie. Serving member of the blood? What kind of tomfoolery is that? Not my choice of words. Check the recent modification to Title 10356.911, specifically subparagraph Parin D and Parin F. Chris took on that faraway look that she got when she and Nellie were talking. Suddenly, Chris snapped. When was that added? You might have Nellie check when that draft language was added, too, Jack suggested, trying but failing to suppress a grin. They were passed at the same time, Nellie reported. Check the legislative history, Jack said. I'll bet you money they were inserted into the bill the very same day. Within two minutes of each other, Nellie answered. We've been had, Chris and Jack said in the same breath. Grandpa trouble, Chris half shouted. And you said that he was your grandpa and wouldn't be any trouble, Nellie said with a clear I told you so inflection. Rather surprising in a computer. Jack gave up trying to suppress his grin. The puppet strings were clearly visible. <laughs> Let me guess. Your grandpa trouble suggested you draft me when we were at that burger joint a couple of days ago. Kind of, Chris admitted. And your grandpa trouble invited me out for a beer and a burger last night, not five minutes after I got the word I'd been drafted. He didn't. He got the receipt. He paid for the chow. He also showed me the precise section of the new law, <laughs> pointed at it upside down on the table when my computer found it and projected it there. <laughs> upside down. I've been played, Chris growled. I've been drafted. Shall we debate which of us got screwed over the most? I will never trust Grandpa Trouble ever again, Chris muttered. So, Jack said, how do I get undrafted? Let's think about that, Chris said. Nellie, could you ask Lottie to send up some coffee? Do you want tea, Jack? Coffee will be fine. Chris settled into an overstuffed chair in an alcove created by space between bookshelves. Jack took the other chair and leaned back, doing his best to look like he had not a care in the world and was in total control of his situation. Chris put on the same face. Of course, she did have control of the situation, right up to the moment when she would make another break for the door. Then he'd stop her, and who controlled what would be an open question, or one requiring a judge. Interesting, Chris thought. Should I take this bit of vagary to court? Would she have to sit safe in the library until she got a decision? And would any decision from a judge do any good when she and Jack were a hundred light years from there and up to their noses in the kind of messes Chris was wont to stumble into. No, this one would have to be settled between them, and settled between them, and settled between them. Chris had not solved her problems as she thought she had. Instead, with some help from her grandpa trouble, she'd gotten a whole new set of problems. Maybe I should undraft you. That way I'd only have to put up with you when I was on Ward Haven, Chris said. Did you intend to say that out loud? And do you mean it? Jack asked. Mm, it's a thought, Chris admitted. But all the pot shots that have been taken at you in the last couple of years happened when you were off planet, as your grandpa Trouble pointed out. You do need some kind of protection off planet. And you intend to give it to me by keeping me locked up? No, I'd provide it to you by keeping you from taking unnecessary risks. And what's an unnecessary risk? Chris shot back. One that you don't need to take. Like visiting my friend in the hospital? I didn't interfere when the troops were in bed, Chris. But Penny's getting out today, and she might as well come here as any other place for lunch, says you. Jack's biting reply, likely in the tenor of a six-year-old, was swallowed unsaid when the guard corporal arrived with a tray of tidbits and a coffee carafe. I was getting some coffee for the crew, and the cook asked me to deliver these to you two, he said in a shameless lie. Thank you, Jack said, using an officer's voice that sounded to Chris remarkably like one she'd heard in the movies. 
That will be all. Thank you. The corporal's eyes widened a smidgen, and he made a quick withdrawal. You're getting that down fast, Chris remarked as she poured herself some coffee. She put the carafe back and left him to pour for himself. Jack had seen two cats walk stiff-legged around each other while taking each other's measurements. Clearly, he and Chris were in that stage of, what should they call it, their relationship? Agents did not have relationships, they had primaries. What did marine lieutenants have? More particularly, what did marine lieutenants who were chief of security for a serving member of the blood have? Jack remembered that crack Chris had made about not being able to draft a husband. He squelched a scowl and promised not to let that cat out of the bag. He took a deep breath and began again. Keeping you from getting your pretty head blown off is not as easy as you seem to think. Here on Ward Haven, I can call on all the resources of the service. During your little sojourn on Tarantic, we were behind the curve most of the time and making everything up as we went along. People get dead very quickly doing that, even people with as much luck as you seem to have. I'm not a hothouse plant. I do what I have to do, Chris said. I thought it was your job to see that I did what I had to do. Have to do, or want to do. Jack shot right back, without need for a second of thought. Maybe I should just undraft you. Let things go back to the way they were. Jack gave that a moment's thought. If I took away from my conversation last night with your grandpa trouble what I think I heard, I suspect that you will find it a lot harder to undraft me than it was to draft me. Chris frowned at him. Nellie, produce the paperwork on Jack's draft, or whatever they're calling it. Jack had his own computer project his paperwork onto the low table between them. It looks to me like you originated it, Jack said, stabbing a finger on the first signature among a long line of signatures. But look at all the other people who signed off on it, Nellie said. And how quickly they did, Jack said, actually surprised by both the long list and how many had signed in one day. How much you want to bet me that it would take a year or more to get all these folks to chop on a revocation? I don't have enough money to cover your one dollar bet, Chris growled. The bottom two signatures were Chief Bureau of Personnel and the Chief Bureau of Doctrine and Training. It would be easier to get a divorce than get those two to agree on anything. Jack did frown at that remark. That was the second time Chris had used a marriage analogy with respect to their new situation. This had to be scotched and scotched immediately. Lieutenant Chris Longknife, we've been played. Your grandpa trouble played us with, I strongly suspect, the full cooperation of your grandpa Ray, king to the rest of us mortals, as well as your own father. Why would they do that? Chris asked. Duh, Jack drawled. Maybe because they don't want you to come down with a serious case of suddenly dead. Have you ever thought of that? Navy officers don't need nursemaids, Chris shot back. That's why I joined the Navy, to get away from all the long knife stuff. Other Navy officers aren't dodging nearly the amount of lead that barely misses you, Chris. To keep you alive is a full-time job for a whole lot of people, not just me. Chris didn't like what he was saying, and it showed. She got up from her chair and stomped around the library for a couple of minutes. She finished by slamming her open palm into the wall beside a portrait of Ray Longknife. Feel better? Jack asked. My hand hurts. That will teach you to keep a better hold on your temper, Jack said. I thought you were supposed to protect me. Jack thought for a minute, putting on his best serious consideration face. Nope. That was a learning experience. One should never interfere with senior officers and their critical learning experiences. You're enjoying rubbing that senior officer stuff in, aren't you? Chris said as she returned to her chair. It's the only game I've got at the moment. Okay, let's review our situation like two reasonable adults. We've been played by two of the oldest, smartest, meanest, and deadliest, Jack added. SOBs that I have the misfortune to be related to, Chris finished. 
They got us into this situation with malice aforethought. The chances of us getting out are slim to none. We can throw a temper tantrum. Here, Chris waved her hand to shake away some more of the pain. Or we can behave like two adults. Can we throw a little temper tantrum? Jack asked. I think the last five or ten minutes are all we get, Chris said. Now it was Jack's time to sigh. She certainly was acting like a grown-up, assuming this progressed uphill and not down a slippery slope. He wanted to see what Chris had in mind. I have a question for you, Jack, she said. He hadn't expected that. I'm all ears. As my security chief, would you have let me out the door when I left for Tarantic? Ah, good. A practical examination of what he'd do when she did something. You may recall that I did go out the door with you and violated a direct order from my boss and his boss not to accompany you. I told you you were walking into a trap, but I went when you charged out of here. And would you again? Time for another sigh, this one deeper. Yes. So, you'd let me charge into what you rightly saw was a trap. But you won't let me visit a hospital today? You had cause for risking the trap, saving Tommy, and as it turned out, a whole lot more. There is no benefit to your taking the minor risk you would run showing yourself at the hospital today. Yes, the risk is lower, much lower, but you have a safer option that gets you everything your low-risk options would get you. Call the damn people. Chris made a face at Jack. Nellie. Call Penny and the chief and see if they can make a one o'clock lunch here at Newhouse. Tell them I'll cover taxi fare. Now, are you happy? Yes, ma'am. Your Highness. Now, what kind of backup am I going to get when you're off planet? We'll discuss it over lunch, Chris said, and marched out of the room. Why do I have the feeling that this is the beginning of a horrible friendship? Jack muttered to her back. Chris had Lottie put on a light lunch. Abby just happened to be passing by and invited herself in. There were salads for the girls, sandwiches for the boys. The chief put away two and asked for a third, insisting he was a growing boy. Over lunch, Chris outlined plans for her tour in training command. The fast attack boats, as the fast patrol boats were now known to one and all, would come out of their smart metal hatchery in a standard format. Chris and her team would need to talk to users about making the mods that Squadron 8 had made in haste before the battle. They've just paid a pretty penny for those boats, Penny pointed out. And you want them to pay for extras? We needed them. Yeah, we needed them, your highness, Chief Benny said between bites. But that extra crap ain't making it into the usual news reports. We're the survivors. We were there. They've got to pay attention to us. I have a problem, Jack said. I can't keep her highness here in one piece on my own. I'll need help. Can either of you two lend me a hand? The two others gave the question thoughtful consideration. The chief spoke first. Most bombs have an electric component of some sort. I could put together some black boxes that should be able to sniff out electronics that don't belong where she's walking and give some warning. Some other gizmos might help for other things. I wouldn't mind walking around with them in my pockets. That could help, Chris said. But what do we do when you shout bomb? My dad was a police officer, Penny said. As you saw on Tarantic, I speak fluent cop. I could coordinate with the local police and see if they could lend us a hand keeping Chris unperforated. I could also introduce us to the local bomb squad, get their number on speed dial. That way, when we hollered, they'd know we weren't the type to cry wolf and would come running. Crew, you're making me feel like some porcelain doll, Chris said, feeling none too happy for all the support. Well, face it, Chris, Penny said. You're a target. Keeping someone from using you as a bullseye isn't cheap or easy. Just be glad you've got friends willing to make the effort. As I see it, you have three choices. Go out there and get killed. Stay here and watch what passes for daytime media, or say thank you to nice people like us and do what you want. Or what Jack will let me. You need to thank me for this delicious lunch, Jack put in. 
Chris wanted to go traipsing out there to meet all of you. I'm loving the food, said the chief. But that does seem extreme. Good move, Maureen, Penny said. I'm glad you were able to knock some sense into her pretty little head. There's nothing little about me, Chris snapped, then tried not to turn red as Penny gave her a look, not to her face, but to her boobs, lack thereof. All right, point taken, Chris said. We will all pitch in to help Jack exercise his legal protection of me. Legal, Abby asked, the first time she had opened her mouth during lunch, which gave Jack the opening he needed to tell all of them the embarrassing story of how Grandpa Trouble had played both Chris and him. Many laughs were had by all. Okay, okay, so you know my dirty secret. I can't even trust my own family. Now, getting back to our training command gig. Anyone have a suggestion as to who else we can tap to help us? Lieutenant Tausig's boat survived, Penny pointed out. I saw him visiting some of his wounded in the hospital. How about him? He's regular Navy, Chris said. I figured he'd had enough of the hooligan Navy. These small boats are the coming thing, Jack pointed out. Command one of the boats at the Battle of Wardhaven, a stint in training. It all might add up to his getting his own squadron. Nellie, send him a message. Ask him if he'd like to be tapped for our little training gig. If he says no, it won't happen. If he wants it, he has it. Now who else? It seems to me that the engines on the fast attack boats at the heart of the boat, Penny said. Did your motor mech survive? Motomech third class Tanani did survive, Chris, Nellie said. As did gunnery mate third class Kami, the gal that handled the foxes on the boat. They are all available for reassignment. And they all need to have paperwork to put in to promote them, Chris said. Nellie, fill out the forms for their promotions, then send them the same message you sent Phil Tausig. If they want to ship on with one of those damn long knives again, they've got a berth. Otherwise, I won't hold it against them if they never want to see my ugly face again. Those exact words, Nellie asked. No, Nellie, nice ones. You know my meaning. Yes, ma'am. Your high-handedness. We've got to get you back to Aunt True for a consult, Nellie said. Nods came from around the table. Nellie interrupted their contemplation of her with, Phil Tausig says, to set a plate for him. He'll be here in ten minutes. Does that mean he's in? Penny asked. I guess so, Nellie said. I told him what you wanted, just as nice as could be, and he asked where you were. I think so he could talk to you face to face. When I told him you were having a late lunch at Newhouse, he said to set him a plate. He added something about his dad and granddad telling him never to pass up a chance to eat at Newhouse. Abby snorted at her tea. Something tells me that your foxy old Grandpa Ray has been using poor Lottie as a bribe to invite flies into the spider's web. You go tell Lottie we've got a Towson coming to lunch and see what she sets before him, Chris said to Abby. Of course, your princess hood. You only have to say and I will obey, Abby said, taking a moment to shovel in a good helping of Caesar salad before she made any move to obey. Lieutenant Phil Tausig arrived a minute early. He was tall, dark, handsome, and sported a bandage around his head, so though he was in uniform, he'd left his cover behind. As he settled into the chair Chris pointed him to, Lottie arrived with a Greek salad, resplendent in cucumbers, goat cheese, brown olives, and a whole lot of stuff Chris was unable to identify. She declined Nellie's offer to educate her about Greek food. Dad warned me that your cooking was to die for, Phil said, setting a napkin in his lap. He also said to eat the food, but decline all offers likely to lead to the die for. <laughs> he finished, giving Chris an eye. You survived my last command? I wouldn't have missed it for the world, Phil said, taking a taste. Then, of course, if we'd missed it, we'd be missing our world, wouldn't we? The table enjoyed the chuckle at his play on words while he forked in a huge bite of his salad. With Lottie looking on, 
he did a magnificent imitation of a man passing through Heaven's Gate into Paradise. Lottie rewarded him with a swat from her dish towel and returned to her kitchen. So, Phil said, talking with his mouth full, what are you up to, Chris? And what are the chances those around you will survive it? I volunteered for training command, Chris said. Well, that sounds safe enough. Lots of planets are ordering the new fast attack boats. The one spun from smart metal? That sounds smart on both accounts, Phil agreed. Get the fast attack boats and get them so you can seal as many hull breaches as you need to. Wish I'd had that kind of stuff in the old 106 boat. I wouldn't have lost my engine room crew. My motor mech survived, and I'm asking him to join us, but I lost most of my gun crew. I could fill in that hole, Phil said. You planning on having someone to cover every crew slot on a boat? If we've got good folks, they can teach their job to the new boat crews. Penny, you and I can handle the new skippers as I see it. Phil munched his salad for a long moment, then put down his fork. It looks like a fun assignment. What are the odds that I'll take the shot intended for you? It's my job to get the shooter before they take the shot, Jack said. I'll be working with Penny, who will be coordinating with the local cops and intel sources. Your job shouldn't be any more dangerous than the average Navy lieutenant's. <laughs> yeah, right, Phil said. My little sister is a big fan of yours. She's been following you since you got that princess thing going. But she's also found some background stories on you that are fit to make a guy's hair stand on end. Probably all true, Chris said, trying to sound contrite. Well, Phil said, raising his water glass in salute. As John Paul Jones said, Give me a fast ship, for I intend to go in harm's way. Let's do this thing. A month later, Chris and Phil had two of Boynton's brand new fast attack boats out and were putting them through their paces, slamming them through the most gentle of Nellie's jinking patterns to show the skippers and crew how it was done. Chris canceled the exercise when their third crew casualty occurred. The skipper, a captain in his mid-forties, twisted his back. He'd been sitting in his own seat on the small bridge when he turned to see something. Chris wasn't sure what, and put his back out painfully. His was the second back injury. There was also a gunner's mate with a painfully strained shoulder. Thanks for calling it off, Phil said on net. I've got three crew casualties, too. Chris had suspected she had a problem when she took the boats out that morning. She just hadn't known how fast and in what way the problem would manifest itself. Boynton had maintained a small fleet of 12 light cruisers, all left over from the Aitichi War 80-some years ago. The present administration had jumped at the idea of retiring the cruisers and replacing them with fast attack boats. The bean counters were sure they'd save loads of money on maintenance and reduced crew costs, since the small boats would be cheaper to run, require less upkeep, and need a crew of 25 rather than 500. The Navy Personnel Division, however, had run the RIF, Reduction in Force. All 12 of the cruiser captains now commanded a boat, and the youngest crew member was a 30-something petty officer first class. It was no wonder that Chris had incapacitated three of her 25 crew members in just 10 minutes of radical maneuvering. Can you explain to me why you were bouncing my ship all over the place at high G acceleration? The captain of the boat grumbled. His ship, her boat. They were far from a meeting of the minds here. These fast attack boats, Chris repeated what she'd said at least a dozen times during briefings, have no ice armor. They can't afford to take any hits. Their best defense is not being there when the enemy gets a firing solution and shoots. You have to be someplace other than where they expected you to be. These boats don't sail in a straight line for more than five seconds. Three seconds is better. That's what the jinx pattern and the high G accelerations and decelerations are all about. You have to be unpredictable. But these ships are all that new metal stuff. If we take a hit, we can patch it in no time. Yes, sir, Chris agreed, and had Nellie pull up a diagram of the ship on the main screen in front of them. But look at your boat, Captain. You take a hit in the engine room, you can patch the hull, but you're dead in space. You take a hit among the weapons, and real quick, you're just out for a scenic cruise. 
75% of your hull length is mission critical. Odds are you take one hit and you're out of business. You have to avoid that hit. Your jinking will put my crew out of business long before I can get in range to do anything to an enemy ship, the captain growled. The trip back to the station was at a comfortable 1G and very quiet. You've put six of my men in sickbay, including one of my captains, Admiral Villanueva roared. Two of them look to be headed for disability retirement, maybe more. You're supposed to teach my navy how to use these damn mosquito boats, not destroy my fleet. Sir, may I remind you that these damn mosquito boats blew six super dreadnoughts out of space? However, these fast attack boats are a young person's weapon. They need a crew that is young and agile and can take the pounding a hard approach maneuver requires. <laughs> You've given me a crew more suited for a retirement home. And, sir, their age does not denote the level of experience you claim the day I arrived. Your cruiser spent most of the last ten years tied up to the piers awaiting critical spare parts. The last time you had any of them away from the pier was for the 80th anniversary of the ending of the ITG War. And even then, three of them had to serve as open house ships because their engines couldn't be made to work. So, you would have me beach these good men and keep a bunch of insolent whelps for my fleet, young lady? Chris examined her options and found only one. Yes, sir. Not on my watch. You can take your bunch of snot-nosed kids and fire another navy to wreck. I will tell your president that, Chris snapped. I've got a meeting with him this afternoon. The president had scheduled the meeting shortly after his office had learned of the planned exercise. Chris had hoped she'd have good news for him. Doubtless, he'd have all the bad news long before she got there. Chris was right. The president was eyeing a report as she entered his office. Six injured, four being recommended for disability retirement. Lieutenant Longknife, 12% casualties and not a shot fired. How many of these training exercises before I have no Navy? Sir, as I explained to you the day I arrived, the fast attack boats survive by not being where the big ship's fire control predicts that they will be when they shoot. They need things like foxers, chaff dispensers, and other decoy devices to encourage the enemy to expect one thing while we do another. We also need better high-G stations, not ones pulled out of the old cruisers, and small high-acceleration rockets that can create a threat to the enemy ships and tie up their fire control solutions. Chris had more to say, but the president cut her off. Yes, I know. You told me. But, Lieutenant, you must understand. Those boats are not being given away by your grandfather, Al. They cost us a pretty penny. We are saving some money with the smaller crews. And these new boats don't have the voracious appetite for spare parts and yard time that those old wrecks required if they were ever to pull away from the dock. Still, we need a year or two of savings before we can afford to take a bite out of your long wish list. Maybe I should come back in a year or two? Chris said. Yes, maybe you should. The president immediately agreed. Chris told her crew to pack. They were heading for a new assignment. None of them looked at all surprised. Chris's next assignment looked to be a whole lot better than the last. Harmony had bought only three fast attack boats and loaded them with what Chris had considered her minimum list, which was not at all short. She also knew the general manager on Harmony, Jim Swanson, and his lovely wife, Anita, and, of course, their now eight-year-old daughter, Edith. The kid was now eight, because Chris and a platoon of Marines had rescued her from kidnappers. The first night on planet, Chris and her officers were invited to dinner at the general manager's residence. Mr. Swanson threw quite a party for them, and Edith got to stay up late. Dinner was done, and Edith led off to bed when Chris finally got to settle down over coffee to discuss why she was there. You've made a good purchase, she told the general manager. My security consultant thoroughly researched the matter. He read me your paper on just what it took to get the maximum fighting ability out of the new ships, and I told him that was what we'd buy. But only three? Chris asked. For now. 
We operate on a two-year budget cycle. I've penciled in three each for the next three bienniums, so we should end up with a full squadron in eight years. And what with the way technology advances, I dare say the last three boats will likely be much better than the first three, don't you think? I would certainly hope so, Chris agreed. But about the crews, sir, you have no navy per se. These ships will be under your security consultant. I've never seen that kind of organization. No doubt, Swanson said. We do things differently here on Harmony. Logical, rational, if I may say so. Three small ships hardly need all the overhead of an admiralty. No, they can report to my security contractor, and he can arrange things in a cost-effective manner. A volunteer navy will work quite well. We have a volunteer fire department and a volunteer police force. No need to have a lot of people sitting around on their duffs waiting for something that isn't going to happen on a well-run planet like Harmony. And when Swanson's daughter Edith had been kidnapped, every one of those volunteer police who tried to save her had died to a man or woman as they fell into traps set by the professional crooks holding Edith for a ransom that, even if it had been paid, would have meant her death. He'd learned nothing from that series of disasters. Chris doubted there was anything she could say that would teach him the error of that way. Like most Navy officers, Chris was proud to call herself a professional. She examined her options, but saw no prospects for teaching this pig how to sing. So she changed directions. I've looked over the roster of people who will crew the boats. They look young and fit, but none of them have any experience with space vehicles. Yes, yes, I know. Remember, we have full employment, and I certainly don't want to be the one to add a lot of drones to our payroll. Every cost center has to make its profit. We've given these folks two weeks paid vacation for you to train them. We'll give them a Friday off once a month so they can have a long weekend to keep up their skills. We're even paying them something for their weekends. It's a lot more than the other volunteers get. Swanson fixed Chris with one of his oh-so-optimistic smiles, identical to the ones her father, the great Billy Longknife, wore for all his stump speeches. Chris, you've got the best of the best of Harmony. They're young, enthusiastic, and willing. They will make us proud. Resigned that what she had was all she was going to get, Chris threw her team into making the Harmony Fast Attack Division the best she could. It wasn't easy. Harmony had no space station not as much as a balloon in orbit. Cargo and passengers arrived in orbit and had to rough it in zero-g. Ships offloaded immigrants fast and cargo as quickly as they could, using drop ships whose vacant space was quickly converted into warehouses. For Chris, her team, and the new crews, there was a shuttle to take them up and down each day. Maintenance, however, had to be done in the ship in freefall or outside in spacesuits. To make the best of what she had, Chris started the new crews in classrooms dirt side, while her own team took each of the boats out for a quick test run. Grandpa Al's new shipyards were supposed to have delivered all three in perfect order. It said so right on the bills of sale and delivery paper. While Chris put on a ground school on how to get yourself killed real quick, Phil Tausig took one of the boats out for a run. What he found did not bear out the paperwork. While Chris continued the classroom training, each day, one set of boat maintenance personnel went up to mend the defects of the new boats with the help of Chris's petty officers. Six days later, three boats were mostly up to standards, and there had been a lot of classroom lectures that left quite a few people shaking their heads and wondering what they'd gotten into. Sunday, Chris ordered all hands aboard and prepared for a full exercise. Sunday didn't go all that well. Chris planned to ride shotgun on boat one, Phil would have boat two, and Penny would do her best with boat three. If they'd been tied up to a pier, they wouldn't have gotten away from it. On the one boat, a volunteer electronics mate third class, an electrician dirt side, activated the electrical grid in an order different from the checklist he ignored and blew out several buses. If the antimatter containment hadn't been on its own backup system, he would likely have blown the boat. 
An overeager volunteer gunnery mate third class pushed the button to charge his pulse laser's capacitor before the electrical generators were fully online and blew the system for all weapons on boat two. Penny reported boat three unable to get underway, and when Chris asked why, her friend just shook her head and said, You don't want to know, okay? The rest of Sunday was spent shuttling Chris's ship maintainers around the tiny fleet to help the local crews put right what had gone haywire. At the end of the day, some very dejective landsmen were only too glad to board the shuttle for home. Chris took her crew to a good restaurant Jack had made reservations at and announced that the food and drinks were on her. While her enlisted personnel enjoyed themselves, Phil, Penny, and Chris settled at the quiet table in a corner that Jack was holding down. With a sigh, Chris prepared to debrief a very difficult day. They'd only ordered their own meals and drinks when a bald fellow in a three-piece suit settled down at their table. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Godfrey Lalange, chief security consultant on Harmony. May I ask how matters went today? Penny and Phil tossed the question to Chris with their eyes, not that Chris would have expected the hot potato to end up in anyone else's lap. Not as good as we'd hoped for, but not as bad as it could have been. When you throw a whole load of people into new jobs where everyone depends on each other to get it right, just a few missteps can bring the whole exercise to a halt. In other words, it was a full-fledged screw-up, Lalange put in. I wouldn't call it that, Chris said. Tomorrow we'll do better. The security consultant made a face. Do you think you can find one decent crew out of the lot of them? I'm aiming to make three fully combat-ready crews out of them, Chris said. I only need one. Give me one good crew that can get their boat out to rendezvous with an incoming freighter, pass a team of inspectors across, and follow them back to orbit, and I'll be happy. Inspectors? Chris said, letting the word hang there for Lalange to confront. Cargo inspectors, Lalange shot back. Someone to go over the manifest and make sure what they say they've got is what they've got and nothing else. We've got a black market popping up on Harmony, so we don't need a black market undercutting the prices at Collingwood's. No, we don't. Chris was familiar with the concept of black markets. They usually sold things that were in short supply at outrageous prices. She'd visited the one and only department store on Harmony. It sold everything from bananas to shirts and anything else a growing company town needed at about twice what it cost on Wardhaven. Mr. Lalange wasn't talking about a black market. His concern was smugglers slipping in cheaper stuff and undercutting what appeared to Chris to be the company store. All was not harmonious on Harmony. You're willing to hire full-time customs inspectors to check out a couple of ships a month? Jack asked. No, we'd never fill these slots full time, but I've got three job applicants who will fit in quite well to my other security vacancies and do this when we need it. Full employment, you know. Yeah, we've heard, Abby said. Sometime in the discussion, Chris's maid had joined the table. Can't have anyone sitting around on their duffs. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, you know. Yes. Most certainly, Lalange agreed, the sarcasm wasted on him. Well, we'll take the three boats out tomorrow, and I should be in a better position to answer your question after we complete a few drills. I'll see you then. The table stayed silent until the door closed behind him. I do not like that man, Abby said. I do not like that man having command of this navy, Chris said. He wants a coast guard, Phil spat. Not even that, just a customs service. And he's the one the general manager expects to run his navy, Chris said. This is not going to end well. Penny sat staring off into space. Chris had a strong suspicion what was behind that sad face her friend wore. Her Tommy had fought on a fast attack not nearly as good as the ones in orbit here. He'd fought on it and died with it. Here they were spending the precious time they'd been given at such high cost to Tommy, doing nothing this planet really wanted. 
It was enough to make Chris want to pack up and leave that very night. Instead, they put their heads together, coming up with a plan that would give the planet what it needed, not what its management wanted. Next morning, Chris organized her volunteers, not by ships, but by ratings. All the electronic techs in one group, with the petty officers from Chris's staff. Likewise, all the gunners, the motor mechs, and other ratings were split up, so all three boats' volunteers were matched with some of Chris's experienced hands. Chris then established a radio net for each group and sent them on their way, with orders not to touch their equipment until they were told. Once aboard ship in orbit, Chris went on the general net and explained how today would be different from yesterday. I will order the first group to go through its startup checklist. The training petty officer will lead you through your list, and each boat will do them one check at a time until all three ships are ready. Then we'll go on to the next critical step to bring a boat online, then the next, until the boat is powered up, armed, and ready to get underway. Do you understand me? Chris got back a ragged series of yes, yeah, and aye, aye, ma'am. The electrician mates will begin the first checklist. Petty Officer Rhodes, you may begin. And the petty officer began to meticulously take all three boats through the startup process. This is going to take forever, the skipper of boat one complained to Chris. I expect we'll be underway by noon, Chris said. Quite a bit sooner than we were yesterday. The skipper settled back in his chair. Chris switched her board to follow the electricians on all three ships as they went down their checklists. In a moment, the skipper of boat one did likewise. The electricians finished with no damage done. Chris ordered the motor mechs into their checklist. An hour later, with no surprises, the gunnery mates got their turn. Then Chris had the bridge watch go through their own startup procedures. It was 11.55 hours when each captain reported his ship ready to get underway. Chris smiled at the skipper of boat one. He returned a rather sheepish grin. Now Chris had her second challenge of the day. The boats were ready to get underway, but how did she get them moving without crashing into each other? Pat Ron 8 had taken off in formation flying. There had been a few close calls, but nothing that couldn't be hammered out and painted over. Chris had strong doubts the skill levels of the crew she had here were anywhere close to Pat Ron 8's. So Chris ordered boat three, the last in line, to drop into an orbit 50 clicks lower, stabilize herself in a circular orbit, then return to a position 200 kilometers aft of her present position. The skipper responded with a cheery, aye, aye, ma'am, and began the retro burn. After watching the three-boat drop away safely, Chris waited 15 minutes before ordering boat two to change to an orbit 50 clicks higher, before returning to the orbit 100 clicks farther aft. They watched for another 15 minutes as it began its retro burn, dropped lower, then rose higher. What do you want me to do? Maintain the present orbit? Boat one skipper asked Chris. No, you will drop down 90 kilometers for one orbit, then go up to 150 kilometers above our present orbit. Then you will return to this location. Ready for it? The skipper turned to his navigator, a mathematician for Harmony's one and only bank in her day job. She studied her board for a long minute. She'd been plotting both of the other two ships' courses. Now she added her own planned course, checked it against the others, and grinned. We can do that, Skipper. Give the helmsman the course, Navigator. Aye, sir. Retro burn in five seconds, the helm announced. Chris chewed her lower lip. There were none of the standard procedures on the bridge that she'd come to expect on a Wardhaven warship. None of the captains repeating the Navigator's course to the helm and the helm repeating it back. Then again, these boats were small enough that everyone on the bridge had everyone else's eyes on them. What was the saying? The right way, the wrong way, the Navy way, and the small boats way? How much could Chris expect to teach these people in the time allotted? She'd have to think about that. Six hours later, all three boats were strung out aft of the shuttle by a hundred kilometers each. There had been no collisions. 
That night, Chris bought supper and drinks for her team and all three crews. The next day was another day of bringing the boats online one checklist at a time, though it went faster. They launched into individual boat maneuvers an hour earlier and did all three orbit changes like Chris had done with boat one. They were equally successful in avoiding dents and dings to the boats. That evening, the skippers bought their crew's supper. Chris set the report time for an hour earlier next day and was met with cheerful cooperation. That day, Chris sped up the checklist process. As soon as the electricians were a quarter way through their startup, she launched the motor mechs into their list while pointing out to the skippers exactly why this would work out fine. The motor mechs were about a quarter of the way into their startup when the bridge crew could start their list. As soon as the electricians finished their checklist, with the motor mechs about halfway through theirs, the gunnery mates started. The entire startup process was finished in an hour, drawing a cheer from all hands. Then Chris started squadron maneuvering. First, she strung the three boats out in echelon, 50 kilometers apart. Then she started a slow orbit change, watching to see how well each boat did the exercise and how close they came to ramming each other. The two-boat wobbled a bit and got to within 30 clicks of both the one and three boats at different times. The three-boat dropped way back at one time, almost a hundred clicks, then hurried to catch up and zoomed up on boat two. That boat, at the moment, had fallen well back. The two boats were within ten clicks of each other before the skippers realized their danger and got themselves back into the proper formation. Chris said nothing. She didn't have to. All three bridge crews were well aware of their errors and doing all they could, under the watchful eyes of Chris's officers, to get it right. Chris let the skippers critique their own performance that evening over a shared supper table with Chris's officers. The next day went better. By Saturday, Chris was ready to run the squadron out for a circumnavigation of the moon with very gentle battle drills both coming and going as they practiced going through a series of jinking maneuvers that Nellie had slowed down from what she considered her least safe jinx pattern. Still, it left all three volunteer crews sweating. You got a whole lot worse knocking about than this during the battle, didn't you? The skipper of boat one said as his crew began the shutdown procedures. A whole lot worse. You'll need a lot of practice before you're ready for a real fight. Yeah, that's kind of what me and the other skippers decided last night after dinner. We are all having dinner at the general manager's residence tonight, Chris said. Yes, they've even bought uniforms for us officers, the skipper said, not at all sounding like the honor carried the desired freight. I'll talk to Mr. Swanson about some more training time. Say, another month, Chris offered. It would sound better coming from you. We'd most likely be accused of trying to shirk our day jobs. I'll broach the topic, Chris agreed. Dinner was a most special affair, all the senior assistant general managers were there with their wives. Chris couldn't help but notice that all her skippers were men, and now the full command structure of the planet drove the point home clearly. Harmony meant for women to stay in their place. The more Chris got to know Harmony, the more she was taking a dislike to the place. Still, she played with Edith, as much to please the girl as to let her see that a woman could command as well as any guy. It was late in the supper before Chris could get a quiet word with the general manager. He listened to her report, making nice sounds at the beginning, but grew more silent and close-faced as she worked up to her point. Your crews are good, solid workmen in their boats. They can share the same space without doing harm to themselves and those around them. However, they are nowhere near combat ready. They'll need at least a month's more training, most likely a year. They also need to practice regularly or they will get rusty. Good fighting crews need at least one good drill a week to keep their skills up. But, Swanson pointed out, these crews can't just sit around between drills. Many of them are critical to their cost code making its profit expectation for the quarter. They can't be spared. Chris was getting so tired of hearing that. But if they aren't spared, they could not only lose what edge they have, 
they could also become a hazard to themselves and to any ship that shares space with them. Swanson's frown deepened, but he said nothing. Then he reached for his phone. Pardon me. I have to take this call, he said, and headed out of the room. Chris had heard no ringtone. Worse, when he punched in, Chris distinctly heard a dial tone. For a long moment, she considered chasing after Swanson, then gave it up. Making a scene would not gain her anything. Nothing she could really do would gain those three boat crews anything. Chris swallowed frustration she could do nothing with. She'd been played again. The contract security chief wanted a customs inspection boat, and he'd gotten exactly what he wanted. Very likely, it was exactly what Swanson wanted all along. Nellie, could you find out how big an interest Swanson and that security consultant have in Collingwood? I tried, Chris. That information is not available in any public database. Should I try accessing their private accounts? Chris considered what she'd do with that information if she got it. From what she'd seen of the media on Harmony, it was just as tightly held a company adjunct as the company store. No, Nellie, it wouldn't do us any good. Chris left the party weighing her other options. She could muster the crews the next day. It was, after all, a Sunday. And if she did the same on Monday, what would they do to her? To the crews. Ugh. Chris was still considering her options when she started throwing up. Jack had her to the emergency room in under five minutes from the time she first complained. The doctor on duty muttered something about food poisoning, and they were pumping her stomach two minutes later. Penny suggested that they save the contents for analysis as they were removed from Chris's room. We all ate the same food, Abby observed. Strange, you're the only one up chucking your toenails. Penny and Jack exchanged glances, and Penny left to oversee the examination of Chris's stomach contents. She was back two minutes later. They were already flushed. Now the glances between Jack and Penny were downright deadly. How am I, Doc? Chris asked the attending physician. He muttered words they either couldn't hear or understand as he continued his examination. When he asked Chris to close her eyes and bend forward, Chris about lost what little was left in her stomach. I think you have a bit of an inner ear infection, too, the doctor said. I work in orbit, Chris said dryly. Not for the next two weeks. Maybe more the doctor assured her. Now it was Chris's turn to join in Jack and Penny's glances. The options she'd been considering suddenly came down to no option at all. Surprise of surprises, a freighter with passenger space was making orbit as Chris was discharged. Her crew was packed and on it when it broke orbit 12 hours later. Do we count that as an assassination attempt? Abby said dryly or just another planet making it clear that it don't want any long knife casting a shadow on it. Chris shrugged and checked to see who was next on her training list. The long knives went way back on Savannah, a heavily industrialized planet. Grandpa's ray and trouble were fondly remembered. The Battle of Bear Mountain was a well-maintained and popular visitor attraction. Most frequently, it was used for a picnic on a good spring or summer day. Savannah could have afforded an army and a navy as big as Wardhaven's. However, the bad taste left behind by the military director Melassi had resulted in Savannah's doing just fine with only a police force and a volunteer National Guard for emergency services. But that was during the peaceful days of the Society of Humanity. Even military-allergic Savannah was looking for something to protect the space above their heads. They hadn't ordered fast attack boats from Grandpa Al, but rather had bought the plans for the boats and were spinning them out in their own yards. Six were done, and another six were expected to commission in six months with more to follow. There was even talk of a few corvettes to allow for longer cruises to picket the systems a jump or two away from Savannah. The total surprise of those six dreadnoughts dropping in on Wardhaven was being viewed by more than a few as a wake-up call. To Chris's delight, 
Savannah was making none of the mistakes of her last two training efforts. First off, they had a major yard on a station with its own beanstalk high above their capital, Tristan. They had built good, well-armed boats and hired new, enthusiastic crews, some with merchant ship experience, who were looking forward to making the Navy, if not a career, then at least a major part of their resume. Chris's team got right to work, using the experience they'd gained on Harmony to get the boats underway on their first attempt. Two weeks into it, things were going great. Then, a bomb in a parked car blew up next to Chris's rental, not three minutes after she'd gone into the public establishment that was vying to be the Army Navy Club of Tristan. The police were all over it, working hand in glove with Jack and Penny. Savannah had had problems before with different nationalities. The old Milassi dictatorship and those who supported it had played the different Earth nationalities off against each other. Still, there hadn't been any trouble in nearly 80 years. Four days after the bomb went off, Chris was invited to a quiet supper at the presidential residence. Over coffee, the president regretfully told her that her services were no longer needed. They had arranged with Wardhaven for the long-term loan of several other survivors of Squadron 8 and would be using them for at least the next year. They might even arrange for them to transfer from Wardhaven's Navy to Savannah's, now that both were looking to join King Raymond's united sentience. You have to understand, the elderly president told Chris, Ray Longknife is revered here for what he did. Your great-grandfather Trouble is a national hero. It would be a poor return to what they gave us if we should be the planet where their beloved great-granddaughter met her demise. Chris was none too sure about that beloved, but she and her team were on the next ship out, headed for her next training assignment. Kalia was a new planet with lots of potential, potential that the financial backers who were paying for its startup did not want to see go to any passing squadron of warships who might take a fancy to their hard-earned property. They'd bought a division of four boats and seen to their proper equipage. The crews were a blend of young hands hired away from several navies and new people fresh from trade schools and eager to have a chance at the glory they had heard about from Wardhaven. Chris and her crew again followed the hard-earned lessons they'd acquired in their earlier training gigs. Drills progressed quickly, from just puttering around in orbit to full battle practice with no holds barred. Chris was looking forward to the arrival of a freighter the next day. They had permission to use it as a target for a full-on battle approach. Things had also gone well on the ground. Jack saw to it that they never ate in the same place twice. Penny had arranged with a local security firm to assure that their quarters were never left out of surveillance. Everything was going well. Right up to the evening of the quiet dinner with all the boat skippers to plan the attack on the incoming transport, Jack had set them up at a Greek restaurant. Bomb! Chief Benny shouted. In the restaurant's doorway, run! Chris ran, with Jack right behind her. She'd gotten their borrowed SUV between her and the offending doorway when the reported bomb did indeed explode. That wasn't even close, she muttered as she stood back up. Jack kicked her feet out from under her and she went back down. That was too close. And I didn't say you could get up, he growled. He had his automatic out and was scanning their surroundings. Penny had also produced a weapon and was doing her own search. Their escort of several off-duty police officers, a few with fully automatic rifles, were seconding the motion. Around them, across the street and along their side as well, civilians were hugging the ground and making no effort to draw the attention of all the weapons suddenly apparent on their previously quiet street. An armored police SUV gunned up. A door opened and Jack let Chris get up just enough to throw her into the back seat. Chris had had a long day, a day of hard maneuvers and no lunch. Yes, she'd almost been killed again, but all she could think of was, am I going to get any supper tonight? At the hotel, Jack responded, as he and Penny jumped into the police rig with Chris. It immediately gunned away, soon to be joined by two others. 
As soon as the street widened, they began passing and falling back, making it impossible to tell which black vehicle had the princess in it. Chris got her supper late that night. Abby spent the cooking time hovering over the kitchen help's shoulders. She made everyone in the place take a taste of every dish before she took charge of it for delivery. The next morning, the new chief of the Kalia Navy was waiting for Chris at the shuttle station. We need to talk, she said. It was just one bomb, Chris pointed out. And the first and only bomb we've ever had, she pointed back. It missed me, Chris said. This time. Chris shrugged and surrendered to the inevitable. So, what have you decided? Your Highness, you're just too damn dangerous to handle. I'm sorry, I really am. But we don't want to be the people who have to tell Ray Longknife that his great-granddaughter got killed on our watch. Your work is superb and we're grateful for it, but the potential cost is just too high. So, you're releasing us from our contract, Chris said. No, not all of you. Who? We want to keep Phil Tausig and your petty officers. We've already talked with General McMorrison. He wants you to keep Lieutenant Lean and Chief Benny. After all, his gizmo did catch that last bomb. Lieutenant Montoya, of course, goes with you. Where? Chris asked bleakly. I understand that Mac has an assignment for you. He didn't tell me what it was, but he said to send you back to Wardhaven, and he'd explain it there. Chris scowled. It sounded like a plan to get her back to Wardhaven and bury her deep in the bowels of some paper mill. She deserved better than that. Jack, Penny, and Benny deserved better. She'd offer the last to a chance to stay with the training unit. Jack? Well, if she was stuck in some dead-end job on Wardhaven, he could at least get his job back with the Secret Service. Chris called them together and laid out what was about to happen to her. She gave them their options. They were all welcome to come with her, whatever that meant. Or they could stay and do what they'd been doing. Your call, she said in the end. For a long minute, they just looked at each other. Then Penny stood. I better start getting ready. When are we leaving, Chris? Me too, the chief said. I better start packing you up, Abby said. Jack watched them all, then shook his head. Haven't you heard? It's dangerous to get too close to one of those damn long knives. You gonna pack, Abby said. Don't need to, Jack said, with one of his lopsided grins. I packed last night, after the bomb went off. Let's get moving, crew. I want to see what General McMorrison has come up with this time. This has been an Audible Inc. production of Training Days, a Chris Longknife novella, written by Mike Shepard, narrated by Dina Perlman. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright 2011 by Mike Mosco. Production copyright 2014 by Audible Inc.